What happens to Schrodinger's cat when an observer looks inside the box? The Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics says that observing the cat makes it collapse into being either dead or alive. The many worlds theory says that the observer becomes quantum entangled with the cat and they both enter a joint superposition of the cat being dead and alive. The Copenhagen interpretation and many worlds have become generally known as interpretations of quantum mechanics because from the subjective experience of an observer it can seem like they make exactly the same predictions. But in 1985, physicist David Deutsch proposed a thought experiment to experimentally test the many worlds theory against the Copenhagen interpretation. This thought experiment was also the first ever proposal for a universal quantum computer. Welcome back to the Quantum Paradoxes video series where I show you how to resolve quantum paradoxes by turning them into quantum circuits. In the previous videos, I explained the Schrodinger's cat and Wigner's friend paradoxes, which demonstrate the measurement problem of quantum mechanics. In both those thought experiments, the collapse and many worlds theories give the same outcomes. In this video, I'll explain Deutsch's mind-twisting thought experiment for testing many worlds against the Copenhagen interpretation, and simulate the key ideas using quantum circuits in Qiskit. Before we dive into the thought experiment, let's understand what it is we're actually testing. If measurements are irreversible, then an observer looking inside the box at Schrodinger's cat really does collapse it into one state. I'll refer to the theories where measurements are irreversible as collapse theories. The Copenhagen interpretation is one example of a collapse theory. On the other hand, if measurements are reversible, then the observer looking inside the box becomes entangled with Schrodinger's cat and they enter a joint superposition. So I will call theories with reversible measurements no collapse theories. The many worlds theory, also known as Everettian quantum mechanics, is one example of a no collapse theory. There are various other no collapse theories being researched, including Bohmian mechanics and cubism, for example. A common feature of the no collapse theories is that quantum theory, as it is, can be applied universally at all scales. So it can be applied to detectors, observers, and any other macroscopic system. Deutsch came up with his thought experiment to show that the many worlds theory is experimentally testable against the Copenhagen interpretation. Since the thought experiment only depends on whether or not the observer's measurement is reversible, it can actually be applied more broadly to test any no collapse theory against any collapse theory. I like to visualize this thought experiment by imagining a qubit as a coin. A coin can be in two states, heads or tails, like the qubit can be zero or one, but it can also be spinning, which is analogous to a quantum superposition of heads and tails. Let's say I'm an observer and I measure the state of the coin qubit. This projects it into a single outcome of heads or tails. Now there are two ways my coin can be spinning, clockwise and anti-clockwise. Let's say the coin starts off spinning clockwise. Then when I measure it, I see a single outcome of heads or tails. In this case, I saw heads. Next, I'm going to write down on a piece of paper that I made a measurement. So I'm going to write I, Maria, made a measurement, as you can see here. So importantly, I'm not writing down on the piece of paper whether I saw heads or tails. I'm just confirming that I did the measurement. Let's imagine that I'm inside a lab and an experimenter has control over me and the quantum coin. The experimenter tries to reverse my measurement of the coin. If it works, the coin will go back to spinning clockwise. But if the measurement was in fact irreversible, then the coin will spin in a random direction, half the time clockwise and half the time anti-clockwise. 
When the experimenter reverses my measurements, I no longer have any memory of my measurement outcome of heads or tails. But I can see from the piece of paper that I really did make a measurement of the coin, even though I don't remember doing it. If the experimenter runs the experiment lots of times and the coin is always clockwise, then the experimenter and I must both agree that my measurements are reversible. If, on the other hand, the coin randomly spins clockwise or anti-clockwise at the end, then my measurements are not reversible. The coin underwent an irreversible collapse that could not be undone. Hence, we can distinguish between theories where measurements are reversible and where they are irreversible. To see for yourself how the final outcomes must turn out different for collapse versus no collapse, Let's represent this thought experiment as a quantum circuit. If you're not familiar with quantum gates and quantum circuits, then I recommend taking a look at the basics of quantum information course on the IBM quantum learning platform before continuing with this video. You can find a link in the video description. For this thought experiment, we need just three qubits. A qubit that starts in a superposition of zero and one, which I'll refer to as a coin qubit, like my analogy earlier, a qubit to represent the memory of the observer that will measure the qubit, and thirdly, a qubit to provide a permanent record that the observer really did make a measurement, like my piece of paper earlier. Let's start by creating quantum registers for each qubit. So here we have them all on a quantum circuit, the coin qubit, observer, and record qubit. All the qubits are initialized in the zero state and then to prepare my quantum coin in an equal superposition of zero and one I'll apply a Hadamard gate. So after the Hadamard gate the coin qubit is in a plus state which is like the coin spinning clockwise. Next the observer detects the state of the quantum coin. So let's first consider the no collapse case where the observer's quantum measurement can be reversed. Our observer here is a quantum system that becomes entangled with the coin qubit on measurement. Then we can directly model the measurement using a control not gate. If the outcome is zero, then the observer's memory stays as zero. And if the outcome is one, then the observer's memory flips to one. The coin qubit and observer jointly enter an entangled bell state. Next, we perform a parity check on the coin qubit and observer qubits. So we can check if the observer has a correct memory of the qubit state. This information will be stored in the record qubit, which plays the role of the piece of paper where the observer, who was me earlier in the analogy, writes down, I made a measurement. This gives a permanent record of the fact that they really did make a measurement. It's important that the information about the actual measurement outcome is not stored in the record qubit, so that it stays intact when we later reverse the measurement. We can implement the parity check using control not and anti-control not gates, like this with these two gates, so that if both qubits are the same, so both zero or both one, then exactly one of the X gates will be applied to the record qubit and it will flip to the one state. Alternatively, if the observer has wrong knowledge of the coin qubit state and the coin qubit and observer states are different, then either both or neither of the X gates will be implemented on the record qubit and it will be in the zero state at the end. If we always get an outcome of one when we measure the record qubit, this indicates that the observer made the measurement correctly. To model the last part of the thought experiment, we apply a control not gate to undo the observer's measurement, unentangling the observer from the qubit. I'll come back to explaining what exactly it means to untangle an observer from a qubit at the end of the video. In the analogy, unentangling the coin from the observer returns the coin to spinning clockwise. In this quantum circuit, instead unentangling the coin, qubit and observer, should return the coin qubit to the plus state. So we now need to measure whether or not the coin qubit has actually returned to the plus state. To do this, we need to do an X basis measurement on the coin qubit 
which we can do by applying a had mod gate and then a z measurement. So this will turn the plus state into a zero state. If we simulate this circuit, we should always get an outcome of zero on the coin qubit and an outcome of one on the record qubit. This indicates that the observer truly made a measurement and yet the measurement was reversed. So a deterministic outcome of one zero every time we run this experiment would be evidence for the no collapse theory. So let's try it out. We can see from the histogram that the outcome is always one on the record qubit and zero on the coin qubit when we treat the observer's measurement as a reversible entangling C0 gate. What about the collapse case? To model collapse, we need to enforce an irreversible measurement in the circuit. So after the C0 gate between the coin qubit and observer, let's add a mid-circuit measurement to the observer. This will cause them to irreversibly collapse into either the zero state or the one state, destroying the coin, qubit and observer's coherence. If you're familiar with density matrices, then in this case, the joint state of the coin, qubit and observer is described by this joint density matrix. With this quantum circuit, the record will still say one, indicating that a measurement was made. But the final gates that reverse the measurement and return the qubit to a zero state won't work. The qubit was irreversibly collapsed to either the zero or one state. And so the final Hadamard will actually put it into a superposition of zero and one instead of returning it to the zero state. Using the coin analogy, it returns to spinning clockwise half the time and anti-clockwise half the time. This means that if we run this experiment lots of times, then half the time we'll measure zero and half the time we'll measure one. Let's see if this happens when we run the circuit. We see now that the record qubit is always one. The mid circuit measurement of the qubit is zero half the time and one half the time. And the final measurement of the qubit is zero half the time and one half the time. By comparing this even distribution of outcomes on the first qubit in the irreversible measurement case to the deterministic outcome of zero on the first qubit in the reversible measurement case, we could, at least in principle, experimentally distinguish collapse and no collapse. But can we really reverse an observer's measurement? In quantum computing, we're used to being able to reverse entanglement between qubits by applying a control not gate then the qubits will return to an unentangled product state. To do this to the observer and the coin qubit, we must somehow have coherent quantum control over the relevant part of the observer's memory and the coin qubit. Achieving this kind of coherent control for a living system would be really, really hard and perhaps even technologically impossible. A potentially more realistic, but still very challenging way to implement this would be to simulate an observer on a computer. In order to model the observer measuring a quantum system, we would need to have quantum coherent control over this computer. It is this realization that led Deutsch to later refer to this thought experiment as his first proposal for a universal quantum computer, even though it wasn't called that yet. Specifically in the paper, he writes, sufficient coherence for the interference effects to be preserved will be possible if, for example, the information in the sense organ, the memory, and all other affected parts of the observer is stored in sufficiently microscopic finite state components, thermally isolated from the outside world. Another possibility might be to replace the components by logically equivalent systems of currents in superconductors. As it happens, many quantum computers, including IBM's, are now built on superconductors. You might be wondering, what properties would our simulation need to have to count as an observer? The answer is that they are whatever properties an observer has in the collapse theory that we're trying to test against. If the collapse theory says that the observer needs the ability to think or the ability to be conscious, for example, then they're the properties our simulated observer needs to have. If instead the collapse theory says that an observer just 
needs to exceed some measure of complexity, then that's the condition on our simulated observer too. If the collapse theory says that the observer needs to exceed some mass to cause collapse, we could just do the experiment directly with a mass instead of simulating an observer. In fact, we're reaching such a high level of quantum control over larger and larger masses that we might be able to experimentally test some gravitational collapse theories using this kind of method in the not too distant future. Irrespective of the implementation of the observer, since we're in the realm of thought experiments, we are allowed to imagine crazy things before they become an experimental reality. Notice that whether the collapse or no collapse model is true, we don't have a true paradox here. Within this thought experiment, each theory is self-consistent and will lead to self-consistent results. However, there is a more recent thought experiment proposed in 2016, which claims to have truly found a contradiction when we attempt to model observers using quantum mechanics. To find out about this quantum paradox and decide whether you think it exposes a true contradiction in our current version of quantum theory, watch our next video on Vigna's friend of a friend of a friend. A Jupyter notebook with all the code I used in this video is linked in the description, along with a blog post if you want to find out more about the thought experiment. See you next time.